Hello and welcome to today's RIMS webinar sponsored by Tuvsud Global Risk Consultants, Engineering Resilience, Strategies for Preventing Machinery Breakdown. I am Justin Smolison, Business Content Manager here at RIMS, the Risk and Insurance Management Society. A few notes before we begin. If you have a question for the presenters during today's session, please submit them by writing in the question box. Feel free to ask at any point during the presentation. We will reserve time at the end for Q&A. Following this session, the recording will be available through the on-demand events page of rims.org. And all downloads and contact information will be accessible to the sponsor. RIMS is thrilled to welcome a global audience. And now I will hand it off to our moderator, my friend, Jared Shelley of Tuvzood. Hey, thank you, Justin. And hi, everyone. And welcome to today's webinar, Strategies for Preventing Machinery Breakdown. Uh, as Justin said, I'm your moderator, Jared Shelley, Head of Marketing at Global Risk Consultants from Tufsud. Machinery breakdown can cripple plant operations and lead to expensive downtime. It's critical to keep boilers, mechanical systems, and electrical equipment in top shape while having contingency plans for malfunctions and failures. Today's business climate makes managing machinery breakdown even more complex. Experienced workers are retiring or job hopping to pursue new opportunities, leaving a knowledge gap that can lead to human-caused failures. Also, supply chains are still not back to normal, meaning procuring parts takes much longer than you might realize. In today's webinar, we will explore boiler machinery risk engineering. The presentation will highlight proactive measures to reduce machinery breakdown, how to reduce the possibility of human error, why asset contingency and business continuity planning are critical, and how b and risk evaluations improve underwriting and insurance renewal outcomes. Today's speakers have a wealth of knowledge on the topic. Um, Paul Sinowitz is Global Manager of Boiler and Machinery Engineering here at Global Risk Consultants. And Manny Padilla is Vice President of Risk Management and Insurance at McAndrews and Forbes. Um, let's have these panelists introduce themselves. Paul, would you like to go first? Yeah, thank you, Jared. Again, my name is Paul Senowitz. I'm the global manager of Boiler Machinery here at Global Risk. And I've been in the business a little over 50 years now. Um, I worked for a couple of insurance companies. I've been here at GRC for about 17 years. Uh, so, Paul, Paul's being humble. Paul, know, Paul, you know your stuff more than, more than almost <laughs> anybody I, I've spoken to on our team. So I really appreciate being here. Um, he's a humble guy. Um, Manny, you. would you like to uh, say a couple quick words? Absolutely. Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Manny Padilla. I'm the Vice President of Risk Management and Insurance at McAndrews and Forbes. Uh, we've done everything from cosmetics to military hardware to movie film production. Uh, I've been with the company 32 years. The new, unique issue that I have is that I was in the Navy prior to getting into the insurance industry, and I was in the boiler machinery uh, area. That's great. Well, thanks, guys. I mean, just a wealth of knowledge, um, uh, you know, on our panel today. So um, once again, just want to say thanks for, for being here. Um, so here's how today's program is going to work, everybody. Um, I'll serve as the moderator and I'm going to ask questions to our panelists. Um, but if you have any questions of your own, please use the question box on your screen and we'll answer them at the end of the program. Um, it should be about 30 minutes and then we'll get to the Q&A. So please get those questions in. We want this to be an interactive discussion. And, uh, you know, we're, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Um, but, okay, let's uh, start the show here. What, um, here's the first question from me to the panelists. Um, Paul, let, let's start with you. What is boiler and machinery engineering? Can, can you give us a, a quick definition? Sure. Boiler machinery risk engineering is the evaluation of the assets within a facility. So basically, we go in, we evaluate the breakdown risk and exposures, things like boilers, pressure vessels, piping systems, or electrical assets, transformers, motors, switch gear, and also mechanical assets such as your pumps, compressors, and production machinery. So basically what we do is we look at the, uh, the installation, evaluate the risk of, uh, of your equipment. To see, we want to know if the equipment's installed to industry standards, best practices, or different applicable codes and standards, such as ASME, IEEE, API codes, things like that. The other thing we do is we evaluate your operating procedures and practices. 
to see that they follow uh, the OEM standards. And then we we're also want to look at maintenance. What's your maintenance philosophy? Is it corrective maintenance where you're repairing things all the time? Or does your maintenance philosophy philosophy follow a proactive uh, route? So basically, we're going to look at predictive maintenance, preventive maintenance. So are you using infrared thermography, vibration, oil testing, and how that uh, figures into your maintenance program. And then uh, last but not least, what we do is we offer recommendations to control the risks and exposures that we find. And a lot of uh, what we do is we're going to evaluate it, present that information to the client, to the risk manager, or the so he can send it to the underwriters to see uh, what the appetite for risk is. That's that's what the uh, risk manager use what usually wants to know. So, Jared. Yeah, Manny, would you uh, like to add something? Yeah, what I'll do is I'll expand on you know the need for boiler machinery insurance and and the whole process. I mean this this industry really uh, came together after there were massive explosions back in the 1850s. I think they were saying there was a massive explosion once every four days. And then there was a, uh, a, a ship, I forget where it was, uh, I think it was called the Sultana, where there was a massive explosion on that and 1,500 lives were lost. So, you know, it, it became a very uh, direct need, not only for an insurance uh, product, but for an engineering discipline to control the potential for these issues. Thank goodness, because of all this um, work that's been done in this industry, the engineering part and the assessment part has greatly reduced those exposures. Yeah, thanks, guys. Um, I didn't know all that history. That's uh, that's pretty amazing. Um, second question for me is, um, let's go to you, Manny. Supply chain issues have become critical, uh, you know, during the COVID nineteen pandemic and and the aftermath. Um, but now that we're a few years removed, what do supply chains look like? Does it still take a long time to get equipment and parts? Well, definitely, supply chains are definitely still delayed. Not only are are they delayed because of the COVID trends uh, issues and just distance between point A and point B. You know, there's a lot of different factors that are affecting it. You know, so, certain um, machinery takes years to build. You know, I'm, I'll talk about some of those uh, particular items. You know, it's the, there's extra time that's needed to ship from point A to point B. Uh, critical equipment like transformers and switch gears take years in some cases to deliver. And then skilled labor, which is the most important factor here when you're talking about technical engineering issues, uh, is difficult to attract and retain. Yeah, Paul, anything? Yeah, I'd like to add on uh, a little bit to that. As Manny said, parts are taking long, longer to deliver. And materials, component parts, all those, the availability of those are causing a uh, delay in, in production of, of your machines. Basically, the other thing you're going to find is the availability of the technicians, things like welders, uh, electricians, mechanics, all industry is seeing. Uh, it's hard to get a hold of people in these uh, with these skills. So um, it, that's a big factor for people who, who are building machines, building assets. For instance, a transformer today, I, I take, for instance, a 1500, a small 1500 KVA transformer that could take up to a year to get. And then when you look at larger transformers, the kind that are in power plants, they can take up to three years. If you're going to order one today, to get one built. Circuit, wow. break, circuit breakers, for instance, a main circuit breaker, a 4000 amp breaker for a facility, medium sized facility could take up to a year. And uh, just a little bit of research recently, a boiler, just a, let's say 150 to 200 horsepower boiler can take eight, eight months to a year till it's delivered. So yeah, there's still delays out there. Jared? Interesting. Um, let's go to the next question. There, there are uh, other macroeconomic trends affecting machinery usage and breakdown. Uh, for example, more experienced workers are retiring. Others are job hopping uh, to pursue new opportunities in a hot hiring market. Uh, how have those issues led to a lack of skilled labor and in turn, more machinery breakdown risks? Take that one. Uh, 
Right now, 43% of the equipment losses are due to operator training. So uh, change is constant now more than ever. So it's basically uh, having people with skills, training, training those people with the skills. So we're all try trying to we're trying to struggle with keeping up on the rate of change. But uh, that's the one big thing is finding skilled labor. So if we can't find it, we have to grow it. So that's what one I, of the things that we see. Yeah, what I will do is add to that. And, you know, training is training and you can get good training, bad training and difference. But, you know, experience, real world on the job experience is very important. While we may have similar types of processes being done in different uh, companies in different parts of the world, you know, a printing press is just not a printing press. You know, there are even you can have identical printing presses installed in two different parts of the world um, and they will operate differently. And that real world experience, that day to day management and operation of that particular printing press, that that's not transferable in a book. You have to roll up your sleeves and experience it real, uh, you know, face to face. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, Manny, uh, what are some proactive measures businesses can take to reduce the possibility of human error? Well, you know, a vetting process is very important. Uh, a mentoring process is also uh, very important. And and a, a very personal training and mentoring uh, operation, I think, is key. You know, so training is training. You can do training all the time. The, 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 the benefit of training is you use you know, real world experiences and you basically expand on that because inevitably you will come across something that hasn't happened at your place, but it's happened somewhere else. So having a connection to the industry and using an industry resource to be able to give you those broad issues is, is extremely important. And then, you know, the machinery itself. I mean, there are certain companies that depend on the outside vendors to do all their maintenance. That is a bit, a bit touchy in my, you know, in my opinion. Uh, but then there are other companies that do all their maintenance themselves, which, you know, gives me a little bit better feel. But but there is value in having that mentoring type of uh, operation here. And hopefully, you know, you're managing the near misses. Well, what we tend to see and what I've tend to, tended to experience in my history is these one-off type events, which are small events, are just leading factors to a catastrophe. Yeah, just add to that a little bit uh, there is a significant competition for people and resources today uh, so companies need to invest in the skills training for their people um, one thing that I found as a parent uh, I'm not an educator but I have taught people a lot of different things over the years and as a manager that we need to instill in our young people a good work ethic because if they have that they'll be interested in uh gaining skills and uh, progressing in, in the work in the workforce. So go ahead. All right. Jared. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, lots of great ideas there, guys. Um, so why are asset why are asset contingency and business continuity planning so critical in the current business climate we, we just laid out? You want me to take that? So um, for me, it, it's all these topics are, are interrelated. So, you know, if you're not planning, you're not planning and not planning is not a plan. So, you know, the, the structure that, that you get with the boiler machinery analysis and this entire issue has to be with being prepared for that event. But it's not a simple, what do we do if something happens? You have to understand what could happen. You have to be able to define that the definition of that then uh, identifies or at least allows you to create a model to respond to it. And what you will find is that, you know, issues where you may have machinery that's irreplaceable. You may have situations where your one-off machine is literally a one-off machine and it cannot be, you know, easily um, you know, intermixed. However, you need to understand your, your, um, your platform, because there may be other capabilities that you have at different parts of the world to pick up a production capacity uh, constraint. However, it may not be the most cost effective. And there are things that you can do to prepare for that. But, it, but bringing it back, back to the beginning, you need to understand what you have and the capabilities 
of the impact of uh, you know damage. Yep, I agree with you, Manny. Knowing knowing what your risks are and your exposures, that way you know what your appetite for risk is. Because when you have insurance coverage, insurance coverage is going to take care of your loss. It's going to you, you'll be returned to whole by the insurance coverage. That's what the responsibility of the insurance company is. But what happens to your customers when you do sustain a loss and let's say you can't make a product for six months? Where are your customers going to go in the future to get that to get that product? So that's one thing you it's hard to replace once a customer walks away from, from your business is to get them back. So um do your cust you know your customers can find another supplier. So thing is do you know what your business interruption exposure is and how you can sustain that loss to to the asset that's what you want to that's the main focus is just uh, preventing the loss to the asset continuing your business yeah Jared? that's a great point paul i remember someone telling me a story about a uh, a facility um you know they they had some kind of a catastrophe like a fire and then they rebuilt the the place and uh, it was beautiful, shining, sparkling new, but the customers had all gone elsewhere. So uh, they were out of business shortly thereafter, after all of that. So uh, that's a great point you just made. Um, let's go to the next question here. Um, how, does, uh, how does a boiler and machinery risk evaluation play into the overall underwriting review? And, and why is that important? I'll take, I'll take that. You know, go ahead. Go ahead. So, from from a customer perspective, for me, sitting across from an underwriter is extremely important because I need to understand what it is that their hot buttons are. Um, they also need to make an evaluation, or they make evaluations on their customers because part of the underwriting process of evaluation is does is your customer a bobo, or do they really understand what they have under under the uh, the, the hood there? So, for me, using boiler machinery risk assessments and and linking it to underwriting is number one, identifying the story, identifying a credible and uh, logical analysis that's also transferable across the world so that it gives it credibility that we're looking at it in the same manner everywhere we have you know, operations. You know, again, we're back into, have we been able to demonstrate to our, you know, our underwriting partners that we have a good handle on what our exposures are and then or that we're doing what needs to be done to prevent, you know, long-term, you know, damage, long-term uh, being out of business. And then we're taking actions to actually take care of that. You know, the one thing about boiler machinery insurance as, as a discipline, it was one of the few insurances where a boiler inspector could shut down your facility immediately if there was an inherently dangerous condition. And thankfully, that hasn't happened very often, but it, it can happen. And then I'll, I'll, I'll turn this over to Paul. Yep. Thanks, Manny. As Manny said, we want to tell the story. So when our consultants go into a client's location, we're going to look at the process and, and the assets and utilities of how they support that process and your production. So we're going to tell the story so that you clearly understand what your risk and exposures are. So uh, basically an evaluation will provide the information to the risk manager and the underwriter so they have knowledge of is it a better risk? So can we help the, the client? If you have fear of better risk, that can help the client get a better premium as well as terms of coverage. Where are your typical risk? And you know, where where are my areas that I can improve and become a better risk? And if you're a poor risk, you know, with the recommendations that we offer, that will help you to get better and then finally up to a uh, but go go to a typical risk and then up to a better risk. Yeah. Um, great. Uh, quick reminder to the audience. We'd love to uh, hear your questions. So please get your questions in and we will answer them at the end. Um, and now we want to get into some, uh, some examples here, right? Some, some tangible stuff that, that, that has happened. So um, <laughs> let's start here with, with Manny. Um, can you provide some examples of how um, global risk consultants, Boiler machinery risk engineers have helped you uh, mitigate machinery breakdown risks. Absolutely. So, and, and I'll take that also help mitigate as well as plan uh, for contingency planning and and future events. So, you know, we have a large portfolio. We may have similar operations around the world. 
that don't necessarily operate in the same manner, you know, you know, uh, engineering from an engineering perspective, but have the same exposures. So it's very important for us to make an assessment and find where the capabilities are in the event of loss and what facility can pick up the load for the other facility, et cetera, et cetera. So the boiler machinery platform that we have in place with, with yourselves is one that we it allows us to do that assessment on a global basis. Um, I, what comes to mind is we acquired a printing business in uh, about 20 locations around the world, and we did um, you know, inspections, and we looked at you know, what the capa capacities were in different areas. But in one particular location, what we found is that after a period of years, they had replaced major printing presses within that same platform, and that was fine. However, the new printing presses were, you know, supplanted or put on an old utilities distribution network. And then when we started to do infrared testing and non-destructive testing, what we found is that the loads were completely off at different parts of the facilities. So I couldn't, I can't remember what the, the wattage was or, or what, what the temperatures were. But what it clearly showed is that what, what was designed, what the, the uh, platform was designed for, and the new machines that were put on top of the platform were completely uh, not mis, uh, mismatched. So with the B&M surveys that we did there and the testing, we were able to identify where we need to make changes in our loads to operate more efficiently. And I forget how much more efficient we were, but we were in the 20% range. And our reduction in time, because um, you know, motors were burning out on a more regular basis, that you know went away, and that production time and limitation actually increased. There was one that that you know really resonates in my mind for many years of experience is we had a particular transformer that was on the pier at the Camden River in Camden, New Jersey. It was a very unique transformer. It had it was built back in the 30s, I believe, and there were no replacements for it. And the new package units that you can you know rely on the utilities to deliver weren't going to meet the needs there. But we were able to identify this because of the BNM um, you know, program that we had in place. And we were ultimately able to find that, that item on the other side of the country. So what we ultimately did, there was a, forget, some kind of a disposition sale. We jumped on it, we bought that transformer, shipped it across the country, and then we installed it at the facility. Uh, so in the event that the, the transformer were to go out, transformer would be, could be used. And not that we're smart or you know, maybe we're more lucky than not, you know, a truck, a month after that happened, a truck hit the first transformer and took it out of service. And for us, it was just a quick switch over with the second transformer. Wow, what a story. Um, that's amazing, Manny. And, and Paul, um, basically same question to you. Can you provide some examples of uh, B&M risk engineering in action? Yeah, you know, one thing that comes uh, to my mind is we had a plant in a uh, power plant in Pennsylvania that had three gas turbines and a steam turbine, and they had they had no spare uh, GSU transformers, which is a transformer uh, connected to the generator. And then there was a sister plant in the same facility in Texas. Now that facility did have a spare transformer for the CTs, the gas turbines but the missing piece was the one for the steam turbines. And the, each of these, both of these uh, facilities, if you leave, lose the steam turbine, they have no, nowhere to go with the steam. So if the GSU transformer on the steam turbine fails, the whole plant's gonna shut down. So what uh, we made the recommendation to purchase a, a transformer for the steam turbine, which the plant in Pennsylvania did. So, uh, long and short of it is the Texas plant had the steam, had the spare GSU transformer for the combustion turbines. Sister plant in Pennsylvania had the spare transformer for the steam turbine. And they knew of one another. They both knew there were sister plants, communication between the two plants. They were covered uh, as far as if one would need uh, a transformer for either or. So that's the kind of cooperation that we can help bring the markets and to our clients. So. Yeah. And um, um, no, go ahead, Manny. Can I jump in? Because Paul, I think you, if you can spend a second expanding on your database of uh, equipment, because that is something that I've used in the past has been very helpful. Yeah. 
basically the the information the nameplate data that we collect from boilers transformers motors uh, a little bit on switch gear things like that we put into our database which we call grc connect and our clients have access to that information so what we do is we gather all this data all the ratings put it in the grc connect we use it as a database that we uh we know what kind of assets are out there. Our clients also have access to their information in GRC Connect as, you know, as part of the contract that they have with us. But uh, I, I've used it several times where one of our clients, you know, they're they're looking for a turbine or a generator or a transformer, and I can go in and find, you know, I, I can give you, well, this location has a similar, lo similar asset and, Put, put uh, you as the party that suffered the damage in touch with the other with the other party. So, and the other thing that we can find, and we've used this in the past to, if a uh, a recall came out or a technical information letter of a certain condition, we can go in there and look at who has that those assets, and then get make sure that you you're aware of that that issue that's out there with the asset, if it's a generator or a transformer, or even a boiler. So uh, it's good information that we collect and, you know, the customers, our clients have avail that available to them. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point, guys. Um, one more question for me, and then we'll open it up to uh, audience Q&A. So, um, Paul, what does a boiler and machinery risk engineering um you know, what does that all entail? And what, what can companies expect if they uh, if they go that route? Well, we'll have a, one of our field consultants uh, around the world get in touch with you. And basically what you come at, we do is we'll sit down with you and go over the process, see what see what you're making, what, what your occupancy is, what kind of process, how are you making things, and uh, where your raw material comes from. You walk, you walk through the process and where your finished product goes. And then the other thing we're going to look at is the utilities that's, that support your process. So we're going to look at your steam. What's your steam capacity? Do you have adequate steam uh, generation installed? How do you maintain your boilers, your, your steam system, your piping system, the condensate return? Uh, then we're going to look at your electricity, you know, from where it comes in from the utility, through the transformers, the switch gear, how well it's maintained. Um, and the other uh, utilities we're going to look at is your natural gas, your fuels, compressed air, waste treatment. A lot of times uh, people forget about the waste treatment, but if something happens to your waste treatment pro, uh, facility or uh, the equipment you have there, can you contaminate where your waste is going? Is it a stream or do you go to the municipal authority? So we, we look at all those utilities and how it supports it. Uh, the other thing we're going to do is look at maintenance, you know, to find out how well you're, ma you're maintaining your equipment, what's your maintenance philosophy. Um, you might contract maintenance out. You might have your own maintenance staff. So uh, we'll, we'll take a look at that. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, figure out your PML and MFL. So these are loss events. The PML means probable maximum loss. That would be something... For instance, if an asset sustains a, uh, a failure, let's take, for instance, a, a water tube boiler. If a PML event would be a low water condition where you would melt some tubes, do some other structural damage to the steam steam drum, that's a, that's a PML event. So what does it cost to repair it? How long is it going to take? And how well are you prepared to deal with that asset while it's out of service? You might have installed spare capacity or you may be able to get a rental boiler. So do you have rental connect, do you have connections available to take a rental? Do you know where to get one? There's a whole series of questions in that respect. The MFL event, that's maximum foreseeable loss. So we'll go back to that same boiler. So with the maximum foreseeable losses, if that boiler sustains a catastrophic explosion, as Manny mentioned earlier, uh, it used to happen uh, very frequently in the early part of the 20th century, uh, where boilers would blow up and they would basically destroy the building. And if anybody was in it, 
they won't be with us after the explosion. So uh, we look at that, you know, uh, what happens if a boiler does blow up? What what are the uh, what's the extent of damage? You know, where where's that boiler installed? Is it installed in the middle of the plant or is it installed in the corner of a plant? So have a but have a big effect on the damage. Then the other thing we're going to do is we're going to make recommendations for improvement to help the underwriters and risk retention decisions of the of your risk management. The thing we do is we we collaborate with the client on the recommendations. You know, just we aren't going to make a recommendation just for the sake of recommendation. If we find something wrong, we'll work on a solution. Because most of the times when we find discrepancies out there in the field, there's several ways to handle it. So we look at the different ways. What's the best way for the client at that location to hand, to, to fix that discrepancy and go accordingly? Jared? Great. Uh, well, thanks so much, uh, Paul and Manny. So we're, we're going to get to the Q&A now. Um, get those questions in. We'd love to hear from you. Um, have a couple here that we'd like to uh, address, and uh, we'll do that right now. Um, so uh, first question, how did the shift to just-in-time manufacturing exacerbate supply chain problems, and what solutions have companies put in place in response? Well, I'll jump on that. So, you know, just-in-time manufacturing was, you know, an offshoot of, I believe, Toyota plants, um, you know, uh, I forget, uh, Kanban or, or, or something there about uh, approach to ensuring that everything was flowing smoothly. You know, the, the one criticism that I have with the whole structure is everything flows smoothly until it doesn't, and then it becomes an emergency. So it's not about having an efficient financial solution. It's about, you know, having more than one solution. So, you know, having this just-in-time manufacturing process is great when it's working efficiently, that's wonderful, but it's not the end of, of the issue. We talked about supply chains earlier and uh, you, using different models and planning and production issues where buying spare equipment, buying spare uh, raw materials, having it in different places is very important. So I think the mindset has to be that you have to assume things are going to go bust and insurance is great, but insurance doesn't keep your customers uh, coming back. And, and Downtime is probably the biggest exposure that you have in this uh, topic. Okay, let's go to the next question. Um, how likely is it that underwriters will give me more capacity or lower premiums because I did a boiler machinery risk assessment? So I think it's unfair for Paul to jump in on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but so, you know, um, in my discussions with underwriters, it was about the credibility of the message. And you know the, the the entire having a process with a, a B and M consultant going out and taking a look at one location is great, but when you take a look at your entire platform, you're able to develop a broader uh, you know a, a broader story. Um, but the understanding portion of this and the evaluation of the exposures makes underwriters a little bit more comfortable that you're a viable risk. Uh, I think the worst scenario is to walk into an underwriting meeting and the underwriter. You know, who knows, may, they may have their own boiler machinery experts that give them the list of 50 questions. And if you're not able to answer any of those questions because you haven't done the proactive work, that's not going to be a good thing when it comes to rating. And some of the most successful discussions we had are with bringing uh, yourself, CUV Sud, to the underwriting table and talking, you know, the engineering lingo and, and talking turkey about the issue. And a lot of it was less you know, have you done it or haven't you done it to what was your evaluation? We we feel, you know, it looks this way and therefore coming to a, a meeting of the minds as to whether or not it's being addressed properly. All right, let's go to the next one. Um, which regulations or standards are most important for my business in relation to boiler or machinery risks? I'll take that one. Uh, basically with uh, boiler machinery risks, you have the jurisdictional inspections. So that's uh, basically you have the, the states or some cities, which are jurisdictions, have laws and regulations that they pass for boilers and pressure vessels. That's one type of inspection. That, and they're looking for 
is the boiler maintained and operated in a safe manner so that they we don't have the explosions and uh, loss of life and property in, in that respect. And then we have the loss prevention part, uh, which basically which I do and my group does. So there we're looking at how does, again, we're looking at the risk and the exposures as far as the process goes. So that's pretty much the big difference between the two. Uh, where your jurisdictional inspections, they're they're uh, going to use the ASME code, uh, National Board Inspection Code, and the, and the state laws and regulations of where that boiler or pressure vessel are installed. Where on the other side, the loss prevention side, my side, we're going to use uh, we're going to use the ASME, the National Board codes. Uh, we can look at API codes. American Petroleum Institute has codes and standards. We're also going to pull in using the uh, IEEE for electrical equipment um, in NIDA. There's electrical codes and standards along that respect. So uh, we also look at NFPA. You know, there's some of that that also covers boilers and switch gear and electrical exposures. So basically, when we are making our recommendations and we're doing our inspections, we're we're using those codes to support what we do, and we use those to support our recommend our recommendations. Great. Um, the final question I have here uh, is: What does boiler machinery insurance cover, and what are some things to make sure I get in my policy? Hmm. I'll do what well, it, what it, what it uh, covers, and I'll do the policy piece. It, say that again, Mary. You want to do what it covers, and I'll take over the, the policy wording piece. Sure. With uh, boiler machinery uh, coverage, you're basically looking at you have to see what's in the policy, what's in the, in the wording. But it's basically your pressure vessels, your boilers, your electrical equipment, your mechanical equipment. The boiler machinery policy is going to look at your assets inside the building. For your fire and property exposures, they're looking at the building for fire, collapse, and uh, the natural hazards. We're looking at your equipment inside and your process. So, uh, and the other thing uh, they're looking for is for coverage. You have to have a loss, a, a breakdown of uh, to an asset. So, for instance, it has to crack, bulge, break something has to happen to that asset to get coverage. Uh, most policies will exclude um, wear and tear or uh, corrosion, things along that line. I mean, if a, if a boiler corrodes till it gets to the, that point and then it cracks, it's still cracked. But if it corrodes and then it leaks, it, it's corrosion. So uh, claims and accident investigations, I did I did that when I was with insurance companies for almost 25, 30 years. It's, it's fun to do. It's very interesting, especially when you watch how the claims are settled, because it gets, like I said, it gets very interesting. It's a complicated process as well. So from a customer's perspective, you know, if we look back in time, boiling machinery, there used to be a separate discipline for it. A separate insurance policy. So well, you could have bought a fire policy, but it would take you up to the point of, you know, mechanical breakdown. Then you'd have to expand and buy a separate boiler machinery policy to take care of the mechanical breakdown issues. But that was only just an insurance issue, you know, within the policy, as far as, you know, what should be included and shouldn't be included. I mean, it really depends on your industry. There are some really um, heavy industrial and manufacturing operations, such as paper and pulp manufacturing, that have humongous boilers. And then you shift completely over to the utility uh, you know, uh, disciplines, which may have gas turbines or co-generation facilities. So it's a bit of a very customized type of uh, discipline. And you do need expert opinion and expertise in handling those issues. The one commonality here is that, you know, a company like TUV Soot, and, and from my experience, is that they're, they have disciplines within the discipline. So when we acquired a sugar, uh, you know, a type of sugar substitute type of uh, operation years ago, 
the big underwriting concern was, is it a sugar plant? And we had to use, you know, boiler machinery analysis and inspection to basically prove out that the, that particular product, while it was a sweetener, did not act as a sugar product would. And for those that don't know, sugar, you know, uh, powders in suspension are very explosive uh, <laughs> and very surprising. So, so I don't think it's a, an easy question, but I do think it's the type of question where that if you don't know what you have, you don't know how to react and you don't know how to adjust. And I think that's the important piece about having a, a direct relationship and then finding the persons to you know, design the program around your exposure. Yeah, great answer, Manny. And, and great answer, um, uh, all, all, both of you guys from uh, from top to bottom here. I, I, I learned a lot um, and, uh, and I hope the audience did as well. I'm gonna leave our contact information here on the thank you page. And uh, let's go back to uh, Justin at RIMS for a quick closing message. But thanks again, everybody. And thanks for listening. Okay, that was great. Thank you to RIMS board director, Manny Padilla and Paul Sinowitz and Jared Shelley of TubeSuit Global Risk Consultants for their time and expertise. A copy of this webinar will be available on the on-demand events page of RIMS.org within a few business days. For more information about TubeSuit, you can visit tubesuit.com backslash grc and follow tubesuit on linkedin also rims is thrilled to continue our partnership with tubesuit in person at risk world at risk world 2024 which will be held in san diego california may 5th through may 8th tubesuit will have a presence with a booth on the exhibit floor and will be hosting educational sessions public registration for risk world is now open so continue to broaden your risk knowledge with TubeSuit and RIMS at RiskWorld, visit rims.org slash events to register and tell them that you saw this TubeSuit webinar from December. Thank. This was a great session. Thank you all and stay safe.